Okay. Okay, we are now recording. All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Ava Ayers. I am the director of the Government Law Center and a member of the faculty at Albany Law School. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the last in our 2021 series of Warren M. Anderson legislative seminars. Um, my colleague, Richard Rifkin, the director of the Government Law Center is going to be moderating today's panel. Before he gets started, I just wanted to share a couple of things. Um, first of all, I wanna thank our sponsors. Uh, we have three sponsors who supported the entire series this year. The Rafay Group PC, a donation in memory of Sharon P. O'Connor, Albany Law School class of 1979, and Brown and Weinrob PLLC. I also want to thank today's program sponsor, Hinman Straub. So uh, a quick reminder, um, if you're an attorney and you've signed up for CLE credit, please make sure to fill out and return all of your forms to Lisa Rivage. Um, her email is lriva at albanylaw.edu, and I'll put that in the chat. We will have a program code um, at some point during today's program for you to enter into the forms. Um, I also want to just say thank you because I am stepping aside as Government Law Center Director after five years. Uh, this will be the last time I moderate an Anderson seminar series. Um, I'm gonna be uh, shifting into a full-time faculty role at the law school, which I'm very excited about, but I'm also sad to be um, leaving and you'll still see me around I'm working with the Government Law Center in quite a few ways. So to everybody who's been part of this journey, um, who's helped me uh, and who's helped the Government Law Center during this time, thank you so much. Um, and with that, let me turn it over to Richard. Thank you, Ava. And I would just remind you that being a member of the faculty does not preclude you from being a moderator of one of our <laughs> It certainly doesn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, Welcome everyone to our uh, final Anderson program of the year. Let me say that this year has certainly been a different year. I need not go into detail. And it's a year in which we have spent a good deal of time considering changes in many aspects of our future. For this Anderson series of programs this year, uh, future policy changes have been our focus. The first program exa examined changes in police practices. The second uh, involved a look at the uh, potential of the states authorizing online gaming. Our third program considered changes in the way we cast our votes. And let me just add that the objective of these changes been enhanced, not to diminish the right to vote. And today we examine potential changes in the judicial branch of our government. While the courts uh, have been considering possible changes for some years, I think it's fair to say that the pandemic has for forced expedited examination. Uh, the challenge in the past year for the courts has been to op operate with as little personal contact as possible between judges, litigants, lawyers, staff, and jurors. With this model having been forced upon the court system, Chief Judge DeFiori appointed a commission to reimagine the future of the courts. Today, we consider what that future might look like. We have three outstanding speakers this morning whom I'm very proud and I thank them for participating. Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence Marks, who will give us some insight into the views that were developed at Beaver Street, the office of OCA. Hank Greenberg, former president of the State Bar Association. He was appointed by Chief Judge DeFiori to chair the commission to reimagine the future of the courts. And he will discuss the work of that commission and finally, Lance Clark, uh, the managing attorney at Cook and Clark in Nassau County. Lance will talk about what the future may hold for small firm practitioners. 
So I'm not going to uh, go into the background or bios of our speakers. You have that in your materials. And rather than spending my time at that, I'd rather get to the substance of the program. And so um, let me open and turn the floor over to Judge Marks. Hey, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to speak today. And um, what I thought I would do and uh, would be helpful and maybe kind of set up the discussion is, is uh, and provide some context, uh, hopefully, is to talk about um, the court systems. And, and I'm going to do this, you know, very general terms, obviously, but the, the court systems experience uh, in uh, dealing with the pandemic when it first hit and then sort of our, our uh, progression through the pandemic leading up to uh, the present. And then I'd like to talk um, a little bit, uh, obviously, about where we see ourselves going in the future and sort of what aspects of, of uh, what we've done over the past <clears throat> 14, 15 months, you know, we maybe see continuing post pandemic. And as I said, hopefully that will provide a context for, um, for Hank Greenberg, uh, who uh, uh, I believe will talk about some of the um, innovative things that the commission has been evaluating and talking about. And then um, and Lance, uh, I assume will, uh, from the practitioner's perspective, will tell us uh, what we're doing right and, and what we're doing wrong. And hopefully it's more right than, than wrong, but uh, we'll, we'll wait to hear from him. So just um, actually, what, if I could just very briefly start and take us back pre-pandemic to February of 2020. And um, we were um, in the midst of uh, continuing our execution of, of what it has been uh, the chief judge's top priority since she took office <clears throat> in January of 2016. That's uh, uh, what we call the Excellence Initiative. And um, we were uh, basically four years into the Excellence Initiative uh, in the days leading up to the pandemic. And for those of you not familiar with this um, initiative, it's a statewide uh, comprehensive effort to improve the quality and the efficiency of adjudication in the New York State Courts with particular focus on attacking uh, backlogs and delays in case processing. And it, it's very much um, a data-driven a data initiative. We, uh, from the very beginning, started to collect extensive <clears throat> uh, caseload data, um, county by county, um, court by court, judge by judge. We, we collect a tremendous amount of data. We review it regularly. We share it with judges and court administrators. And um, I, I don't want to get into the details of the excellence initiative, but let me just say it, it's really, uh, it, it was a highly um, successful program uh, four years into it. There were broad improvements in uh, attacking backlogs and delays and reducing the number of, of uh, older cases in the court system a across the whole state. Um, at every level of court, there was uh, broad progress in this program and dramatic progress in, in some places, uh, reductions in, in older cases by as much as 90% in, in you know, a fair number of courts throughout the state. So I, I think it's, it's fair to say that the Excellence Initiative uh, truly changed the culture of adjudication in this state, which is, believe me, uh, not an easy thing to do. I, I've been in this business many, many years, and, but I, it's very fair to say that, th that there was a change of culture in uh, adjudication in the state as a result of the Excellence Initiative. And then the pandemic came along and uh, our focus turned from focusing on backlogs and delays to more existential concerns. You know, literally, how do we keep the courts open and functioning uh, during a pandemic? And, you know, going back to the beginning in mid-March in, in mid of 2020, which were really the dark days of the of the pandemic, as you all know. The first step we we took was essentially we sent almost everyone home in mid March, and we uh, focused our our exclusive attention on 
on essential and emergency matters. And, and this was an extremely difficult thing to try to define because uh, every lawyer and every litigant thinks that their case is essential. And uh, we agree with that, but of necessity, we had to narrow it down to you know, very limited number of proceedings. And, and we did that. And basically that they're, they were proceedings that um, raised serious public safety issues, uh, raised uh, significant constitutional issues for litigants and uh, examples of some of these essential emergency matters as we defined them included uh, arraignments um, of people who had been arrested and detained by the police, uh, review of bail decisions that had been made, um, applications for orders of protection, civil commitment proceedings, uh, determining whether people need to be needed to be civilly committed because they uh, presented a, a risk of uh, significant harm to the to themselves or others. Um, landlord lockout proceedings and, and things like that. Those that there was a, a fairly concise list of of what we defined as essential and emergency proceedings, and that was our total focus uh, from mid March forward. Um, we within a week or so we were able to um, conduct all those proceedings virtually, which was a tremendous achievement on the part of our, our technology staff. And, um, and that continued for several weeks, but we immediately, while that was going and, 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 and working reasonably well, we immediately turned our attention to the rest of the 98, 90, 99% of the state court systems uh, inventory, the, if you will, the non-essential non-emergency proceedings and um, by mid-April, you know, within three to four weeks uh, of the, the real onset of the pandemic, again, in a you know, very short time period, we were able to expand uh, court operations to include many uh, court proceedings in, in these so-called non-essential matters. And so co court conferences, motion arguments, um, also some evidentiary proceedings, uh, hearings. And this was very successful and really continues uh, to this day where over 20,000 court conferences are held virtually by judges throughout the state, um, virtual motion arguments, um, uh, as many as uh, four to 5,000 decisions and orders, formal orders are issued by judges each week, um, as many as a thousand or more evidentiary hearings. Um, very, very successful program. Um, and then we, um, since not all court proceedings, and, and this is uh, a primary focus of, of the program today, not all court proceedings, we believe can be conducted virtually. We began to plan and eventually resume uh, limited in-person court proceedings in for example, in the summer of 2020, we brought back uh, a limited number of grand juries. Uh, and, and in the fall, the, uh, a month or two after that, we, we brought back a limited number of civil and criminal jury trials around the state. This is the fall of 2020. And then with the resurgence of the virus, uh, later late fall 2020, we were forced to suspend again uh, most of these in-person proceedings, although uh, including the, the jury trials, civil and criminal jury trials, grand juries, however, did continue. And uh, we scaled back as we had to based on the circumstances of the pandemic. But uh, again, in uh, early March of this year, we uh, resumed once again, uh, civil and criminal jury trials on a limited basis. And um, with the decline, further decline in the virus and with the the very good progress of the vaccination program in the state. We uh, took further steps, uh, notably uh, just this past Monday, two days ago, we brought back uh, all of our employees and all of our judges with, with very few exceptions um, are now working out of the courthouses, you know, as of, as of Monday of this week. So this is, um, I can tell you a huge milestone for the state court system. It will allow for further expansion of uh, virtual proceedings. It will allow certainly very carefully and deliberately, but expansion of, of in courthouse uh, in-person proceedings. 
And um, so that, re that raises the question with, with that background, will we ever return to full in-person proceedings once the, the pandemic is, is behind us? And the answer um, I believe um, is no, that we will never return to full uh, in-person proceedings. I think we've very much crossed the Rubicon with, with technology in the court system as Richard uh, hinted at in his opening remarks. Um, we've got judges who literally, um, and I don't say this facetiously um, at all, but literally had never turned on their computers before. And they're all conducting uh, virtual proceedings. Um, it's remarkable. It's, uh, you know, I think uh, a, a great example of necessity being the mother of invention. Um, but I think for the most part, you know, our, we hope that you know, most of those crowded courtrooms that were probably very emblematic of, of the New York state court system, I think most of them are a thing of the past. And again, not because of health reasons, I'm talking about when the pandemic is behind us, but for efficiency reasons that, you know, the litigants and the lawyers simply do not need to travel to the courthouse for every type of proceeding and every type of case. And for the lawyers to have to wait around um, for the litigators, uh, or the litigants rather, um, to have to take off from work or um, pay transportation costs or deal with childcare. Uh, a lot of that going forward, I believe, um, will not be necessary. And, um, you know, the pandemic has shown us that many, not all, but many of these proceedings don't have to be face to face. They can be conducted virtually or even not at all. So just a few examples of uh, what I'm referring to. With, with civil cases, um, preliminary conferences, uh, status conferences, discovery compliance conferences, really can all be done virtually unless the judge or the lawyers have a reason or, or some preference to conduct conferences like that in person. Uh, settlement conferences and pretrial conferences probably um, could benefit from more of them being in person when there's a real focus on trying to uh, resolve the case, particularly uh, cases that are ready for trial. Um, uh, more of an argument that they should be in person, although with, with exceptions, certainly not always. Um, evidentiary hearings, including uh, bench trials. Bench trials, uh, by the way, are, are trials, uh, non-jury trials where the judge uh, the judges find the facts, not, not the juries. Um, so evidentiary hearings and bench trials um, could probably, we could see a combination of both. Some could be done virtually uh, uh, according to the preference of the lawyers and the preference of the judge. Some could be done in person. And um, civil jury trials, very interesting question about um, can jury trials really be conducted virtually? Some states have experiment, experiment, experimented with that. I know uh, the, our commission, and Hank may talk about this, has recommended a, a, a piloting some uh, jury, civil jury trials. And in fact, we are planning to do that um, probably sometime uh, later this summer is to, to pilot uh, a few uh, remote uh, virtual civil jury trials. On the criminal side, um, in terms of uh, in-person or virtual arraignments uh, have been conducted virtually. I mean, everyone who's been arrested and detained by the police in this state going back to the, the middle of March, 2020, everyone has been arraigned. Almost all of those arraignments have been done within uh, expeditious uh, time periods, um, but they're very important proceedings. And I think if you talk to most um, prosecutors and you talk to most um, defense, criminal defense attorneys, they would prefer to have the arraignment um, in person for, uh, for defendants who are being detained post arrest. Um, but there could be exceptions to that. Uh, but routine status conferences, and there are a lot of very routine status conferences in criminal cases, um, can be done virtually. Um, you know, they don't all have to be in person. And in fact, not all may even require the defendant's appearance. I think my own opinion is we bring uh, 
criminal defendants into court uh, uh, in far more instances than is necessary. But certainly those routine appearances can be done virtually. Um, Pre-trial conferences similar to on the civil side where pleas are often negotiated. Um, arguably uh, more of them should be in person perhaps than virtual. And then um, my own view, and I think most would agree, is that you're talking about grand jury proceedings in, in criminal jury trials, that those really have to be in person um, for reasons that we could discuss. Just quickly, family court. Family court, courthouses are uh, in, in normal times are very crowded courthouses. A lot of the litigants are self-represented. Um, a lot of them uh, uh, f um, may face challenges using technology. We've, we've seen that and learned that during the pandemic. Um, so virtual can be a real challenge in family court. But one thing we've started on a very limited basis, and I think um, we're very intent on trying to expand post-pandemic, is to have um, in nonprofit organizations in the communities, uh, houses of worship in the communities, to have um, virtual capacity set up in these off-site uh, venues where cl closer to where people live and not have family court litigants, particularly those representing themselves, have to come to the courthouse for every proceeding, but, but be able to, to participate virtually remotely from nonprofit and house of worship uh, settings in the community. So um, as to wrap this up, uh, virtual um, will we'll be a big part of how we conduct business going forward. Um, as we return to the Excellence Initiative and focusing on backlogs and delays, and by the way, no surprise, the backlogs have grown during the pandemic. Um, that was uh, probably unavoidable, but um, as we return to attacking backlogs and delays, virtual proceedings, uh, we think can be a big help to the extent that uh, they make the court process faster and more efficient. And there are other technological innovations as well in that regard. And I think hopefully that's a good segue into uh, Hank Greenberg's remarks. Thank you, uh, Judge Marks, uh, for sort of bringing us up to date, if you will, on where the court system is. So Hank, what's going on with the commission and uh, where do we go from here? Uh, Richard, let me throw up uh, a PowerPoint um, that hopefully, just give me one moment. Hopefully everybody will be able to see it. Um, how's that? Can you see it, Richard? Uh, is it on the screen? On the screen. Yeah, oh, yeah, I can see it. It's on the screen. You, okay, wonderful. The wonders you, of- you, you have demonstrated your technological competence. <laughs> yeah, you go. Yeah, it wouldn't be good for the chair of the commission not to be able to put up a PowerPoint. Um, well, uh, it, 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 I, I think Judge Marks' uh, presentation is, and, and the end of it, is a wonderful segue to the commission. And what I'm going to do um, in the time allotted to me is share with all of you what the commission is doing, what our mission is, um, some of the projects. I will say before I get into the screen that uh, the work of the commission would not have been possible without the extraordinary support of uh, Chief Administrative Judge Marks and Chief Judge Di Fiore. Um, thanks to that support, the commission, I think, in, in the space of 10 months has transformed itself into um, no false modesty. And I'm not speaking about myself. It's the fabulous members of the commission, the most prolific future looking think tank in the country. It's produced uh, nine reports thoughtful scholarly reports in the first nine months of its existence. And that's because of the support we've received from the court system. Uh, the commission itself just uh, consists of 30 persons um, um, appointed by uh, Chief Judge uh, Di Fiore in consultation with Judge Marks. Uh, I'm excluding myself when I say it's the most remarkable, accomplished, diverse group of individuals I've ever had the privilege of serving with includes representatives from uh, every stakeholder group, I think, within the legal profession, big firms, small firms, legal service providers, academics, um, thought leaders, uh, leaders of firms, large, medium, and small, 
really an extraordinary group upstate, downstate, and diverse in all other ways. And again, that's uh, a tribute to Chief Judge DiFiori and Judge Marks. Uh, the name of the commission tells you a little bit about what we are um, um, created to do, the commission to reimagine the future of New York's courts. So that is to, you'll forgive the uh, uh, somewhat trite expression, think out of the box, shift paradigms, uh, but that's really what we are tasked to do. Um, we would not, uh, I think, have had sort of the wind behind our back that we've had from uh, our conception, strangely enough, were it not for COVID-19. Um, because I think as Judge Marks um, um, foreshadowed and, and described, COVID-19 has accelerated trends that had been moving in the legal profession for years, in some cases, decades, um, and just at the speed of light, transformed things and ways of doing business. In fact, you know, from the beginning of sort of the lockdown in March of uh, 2020, I would suggest in the first three months of the lockdown and COVID-19, we saw more change in the legal profession and in the courts, not hyperbole, I believe this, in the first two months than you may have seen in the preceding 200 years. Uh, virtual court proceedings and the like in the New York State courts, the use of technology, happened with a rapidity that no one could have imagined and would not have occurred, certainly not at the pace that we saw it, were it not for COVID-19. And I think one of the things that the epidemic exposed because owing to the brilliant improvisations of Judge Marks and, and Chief Judge DiFiori, they literally from scratch had to improvise a virtual court system. And in the process they may do with the tools that they had, but in fairness to everyone, no one could have imagined and no one did imagine or foresee uh, what COVID-19 would do to our way of life. And in the process, it revealed certain limitations in just the technological capacity that all three branches of government had uh, built up and relied on up to the moment of the virus. I will not read the entire mission statement to you, but some of the highlights. Uh, our goal, our mission, if you will, is to help the court system and and the users of the court system uh, to uh, adjudicate cases uh, more quickly, more efficiently, and in the process, help close the justice gap and enhance access to justice. Um, almost from day one, uh, Judge Marks, the Chief Judge DiFiori had us busy. Our first meeting of the commission, uh, we actually approved a report. We've been given tasks both long-term and short-term, and one of the short-term goals the court system asked us to do was provide some assistance, some guides to how the courts could begin to open up um, grand jury proceedings, jury trials and the like safely and consistent with public health norms. So our first report literally was approved at the first meeting of the commission. Um, the guiding principles that sort of overlay uh, and, and, and inspire us uh, one is to focus on the consumers of the courts. Um, no disrespect meant at all to the judges and the employees of the court system, but the courts weren't put there to enhance the efficiency of the judges and staff. It was there to serve the public and provide a means to resolve disputes, civil and criminal. So we are laser focused on the public for whom the courts were designed to serve increasing access to justice, and of course, delivering services more efficiently. Uh, I meant it when I said before that the construction of the virtual court system was miraculous, unfathomable before the uh, COVID. No one could have conceived, just to talk about the appellate courts, no one could have imagined that in the space of several months, appellate proceedings would be entirely virtual, oral arguments virtual, court conferences virtual, all filings electronic, utterly unthinkable before March of 2020. Um, and so we have seen literally a digital transformation. Um, and I expect we are gonna see more of that in the weeks, months, years, and decades to come. It's an interesting fact that today, more people in the world now have access to the internet than access to justice. It's a sad fact, but it is a true fact. 
More than half of humanity is now online. Um, we are experiencing throughout society a tsunami of change that technology has wrought, and that change is ever accelerating. Uh, the digital transformation, um, uh, and one of the things the mission, uh, the, the commission is all about, is helping the court system to leverage the digital revolution in society. And I'll explain some of the ways, some of our early recommendations are suggesting that. And also to bring the court system into alignment with advances in the digital world. Now, if we were having this conversation in January or February of 2020, I would have said, no, well, no, we're not there. And that's not meant to be a criticism, but clearly sort of the use of technology and other walks of life you didn't see in the courtroom. And like that, we are now there. There's more to go, but the changes have been extraordinary. A uh, word or two about the process of the commission. We meet every five to six weeks. Uh, our meetings feature presentations from national thought leaders. Uh, no one has said no to us and it's been remarkable. We have spoken to the chief justices of the Michigan Supreme Court, the Texas Supreme Court, <clears throat> who also is the head of the Conference of Chief Justice of the United States, a judge, a judge who's a thought leader out in Utah, academics and others. As I said before, we're working on long and short-term projects. Post-COVID, I think we're hoping to eventually do public hearings and the like. In the, in the meanwhile, we've done targeted outreach to stakeholders. 10 reports in the first 10 months. Um, the commission from day one was committed not to spend years working on a hundreds of page tome that might collect dust on a shelf and that events would outpace. So we're trying to produce in real time reports that are of value to the court system. How we are organized will tell you a lot about the work of the commission. The commission itself is a full group of 30 commissioners meets, as I said, once every five to six weeks. But the real work of the commission, the day-to-day -day work is in six separate working groups that while there's overlap between these working groups as I'll explain in a moment, are all working on different projects, are all producing and have all produced reports approved by the commission and then shared with Judge Marks and Chief Judge DeFiori. The technology working group, just to sort of start with it. This group is and does what you would think it does. Uh, these are technology ones. They think software and they think hardware. They're all about looking and thinking of ways for the court system to sort of take the next step and go to the next level in terms of just sheer technological capacity. So it has already surveyed 9,000 judges and court staff, begun to produce reports to Judge Marks, um, including assistance with the reconstruction of a court systems website, uh, long overdue, so like so many organizations, that work is already beginning possibly restructuring the Department of Technology that has performed magnificently under the most dire circumstances during COVID. Um, the work plan of the group, I just told you a little bit about, uh, but like I said, it is focused on the sort of thing that you would hear if you went to a technology conference. How do you do virtual better? What is the next generation of technology? How, if at all, should the court system move its systems from sort of hardwire infrastructure to the cloud. Those are the kinds of issues it's looking at. The online courts working group, while similar to technology, is different. Um, this group is chaired by two leaders in the profession, Brad Park, who is the counsel, um, 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 uh, rather I should say, uh, the chair of Paul Weiss, which is a large firm in the city, and Mylon Dennerstein, who is a partner at Gibson Dunn. Online courts, I think most people will agree. The idea of actually handling cases, not just virtually doing oral argument, but processing adjudicating cases virtually is not whether we will do that, but when we will do that. It's already happening in the UK, parts of Canada. There are 16 states in the United States that have pilot projects that are underway with respect to smaller matters, traffic court, small claims matters, creating virtual platforms where litigants 
don't have to spend perhaps a day in a busy courtroom waiting for the case to be called, but can actually just imagine in traffic court, not spend a whole evening waiting for their traffic ticket to be handled, but to do all of that through electronic platforms. Uh, the group has already produced its first report, uh, which has suggested pilot projects, which I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased uh, um, um, and proud for the commission uh, that Judge Marks and Chief Judge Fiore have already sort of supported some of that important work. Uh, and you're gonna hear more from this group. It is now putting together a survey of practitioners um, and getting their ideas and thoughts about ways to bring cases online in new and different ways. And one thing I wanna be clear about, this group isn't sort of dealing with um, 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 eliminating trials or really dealing with complex litigation, commercial or criminal, but it is looking at ways to deal with housing court matters and other kinds of matters that more efficiently and from the point of view of the litigants uh, in a more user-friendly way allows them to handle these cases. Obviously, we're focused on the idea and know full well, not everyone has access to the internet. Not everyone can afford a smartphone. Not everyone has a laptop. And still in New York, hard as it is to believe, there are broad swaths of the state that still don't have broadband access in the Adirondacks. So this project is not something that can be executed you know, overnight and yet statewide. But like I said, it's not a question of whether, it's when, and you can be certain 20 years from now, whole categories of cases will be processed, not in courtrooms, but on digital and virtual platforms. The Regulatory Innovation Working Group, um, as the title of it suggests, is looking at regs, codes of ethics, laws that are currently in place, and trying to propose reforms that can enhance access to justice. Let me give you an example. The first report of this working group addressed a subject that is across the country getting an enormous amount of interest, not just in a scholarly community, but in many states in the West Coast and the Southwest are dealing with experimentation, dealing with certain ethical principles that in New York are in, some, in the minds of some sacrosanct. Uh, Non-lawyer ownership of law firms is prohibited in New York, fee splitting, is prohibited. The unauthorized access practice of law is prohibited. Some states have modified those rules in order to provide greater access to justice. So for example, um, clients who can't afford attorneys and for whom legal aid societies in those states are not accessible. There are experiments in some of these states to allow paralegals to perform certain kinds of services. This is a controversial issue um, in New York in particular. Um, many of our bar associations feel that these principles are, are foundational and shouldn't be tinkered with at all. Um, and New York, let's face it, is very different than Utah, which has been experimenting in a whole bunch of different ways. Most notably, no state has more admitted lawyers than New York, over 300,000. No state has more resident lawyers than New York, 180,000. Um, and no state is as diverse as New York in every way, geographic, ethnic, religious, in every way imaginable. Our first uh, report from this working group actually looked at that issue and ultimately concluded that the data um, produced by those states that have been experimenting isn't compelling enough to yet recommend changes to these principles I described. But it did recommend, and Judge Marks and Chief Judge DeFiori are in the process of implementing allowing social workers, for example, to be more engaged in courtroom proceedings and family court matters. That's already been happening. Legal aid societies have been using social workers um, quite a bit. Um, so what this working group is doing, and, and many family court judges would rather deal with a social worker who's trying to navigate a familial dispute than the attorneys. So trying to find an enhanced way for social workers to provide assistance to litigants in family courts was one recommendation that is now being in the process of implementing. Uh, I've just told you a little bit about the work plan. Let's move to the structural innovation group. Um, we have a unified court system in New York. Uh, it is one of the most daunting and Herculean challenges imaginable to try to unify a court system 
as diverse and complex as New York. Why? 63 counties all have their own county courts, all have their own county resources. The clerk of the Supreme Court in those 63 counties, guess what? Is not the clerk of the Supreme Court. It is an independently elected individual known as the county clerk, most of whom in New York State are not even lawyers. And so Judge Marks and Chief Judge DeFiori have to find a way to take these 63 counties with court systems funded to a significant degree by the counties and bring them together. And there are structural obstacles and roadmaps and hurdles that make that different, including a state constitution, one third of which, one third, is devoted to the judiciary. Virtually everything involving the court system, I'm exaggerating a bit, but a lot, I think Judge Marks would agree, is in constitutional cement, can't be changed. Compare that to the federal constitution and the federal court system. Article three, which governs the court system for the entire United States, fewer than 400 words. So there are all these obstacles and this working group is looking at them and I'll just quickly talk a bit about their first report, which deals with something that in 49 other states is not a hassle because in 49 other states, the court system is not dealing with a constitution or a court system with so many statutes adopted by the legislature limiting the discretion and flexibility of our court system leaders. E-filing, the legislature has deemed it appropriate for that branch of government to literally micromanage the commencement of lawsuits in the e-filing system. We're now very close after years and years and years, and after the federal court system has been electrovert digitalized with e-filing for over two decades, we're now just a few counties away from having a statewide e-filing system in some categories. We are way behind the rest of the country, way behind with respect to e-filing. And that's because of the structure over which Judge Marks and Chief Judge DeFiori have relatively limited control. The next report of this group, they're studying it now, is something that in the other states isn't a complex subject for the court system to manage. It's the civil practice law and rules, the CPLR. Over 10,000 rules compared to the fewer than 100 federal rules of civil procedure. If Judge Marks and Chief Judge DeFiori wanted to change the CPLR, could they? No, they can't, unlike court leaders in virtually every other state in the country. The legislature controls it all. That might have made sense when the CPLR was created in the early 1960s, when over two thirds of the legislature were lawyers. With short legislative sessions, they were not only lawyers, they were practicing lawyers. But uh, that can't happen in New York. Uh, very Hank, I just I just want to make sure Lance has an opportunity to give his remarks. So okay, um, so I'll wrap it up. The it's last two working groups, the trial working group and the uh, appellate working group, are looking at the kinds of things you would think of. They're actually focused on the weeds of trial court and appellate proceedings, and they too have produced reports um, with respect to the enhancement of efficiency and those two basic courts. So uh, happy when Lance is done, if anyone has any questions, but uh, thank you all for listening. Thank and you thank very you much, really. Hank, for uh, telling us about really a very informative uh, discussion of what's going on. And now, as I said at the outset, Lance Clark, who's been looking at all of this, looks at it from the perspective of the practitioner in a small firm and uh, let's hear from Lance and get his views. Oh, yeah, and I'm afraid you. before, Lance, sorry, before you start, I just need to share the code for the CLE uh, forms that folks have, which is just the word justice. Let's see, Hank, if you can cancel your screen share, I will put mine up. Okay, um, I'll do that in a sec. All right. Um, but again, it's just the word justice, lowercase j doesn't actually matter. It's not case sensitive, but I will put it up on the screen in just one second. Actually, it looks like I can do it. There we go. Should be popping up on your screens now. 
Um, I'll leave that up for just one second, but again, it's just the word justice. All right, Lance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let you. me uh, first say uh, thank you very much to Richard uh, for the invitation uh, to present and also thank Judge Marks and of course, definitely Hank Greenberg and the commission for the uh, amount of work, the volume that they have uh, produced in a very short space of time. Uh, we all know that COVID-19 is uh, a pandemic that hit us when we didn't expect it uh, and the aspects uh, that it has, uh, of the aspects of life have really been uh, complicated, uh, much more than we anticipated. Uh, the impact on the court system, of course, of New York, the busiest court system in the country, uh, especially downstate, has uh, had its share of impact. And of course, I know that the system has been trying very hard uh, to stay ahead of the, the uh, complications. Large firms and small firms alike must comply with new laws and new rules. Uh, made to facilitate practice through uh, technology designed to assist us uh, to be uh, being ahead of the curve, so to speak. The curve is steep, but attorneys and courts must meet high expectations of the general public that put its trust in the competence of the New York Unified Court System. And, uh, you know, let me say that uh, looking at the time, uh, I will say that uh, I, as if I was before the appellate division second department, I rely on my brief. <laughs> my outline is uh, there and it may be downloaded. Uh, COVID-19 has hastened the introduction of a new era. Uh, most practitioners, particularly folks like myself, thought that uh, uh, times would change gradually, that uh, new technologies and uh, emerging new technologies would be uh, phased in over a much longer period of time uh, and uh, that the new rules as well and, and new laws that impact practice uh, would also be changed uh, very gradually or, or at least uh, give you a chance to, to be able to, to digest them. But in point of fact, uh, it has come about rather quickly. And of course, judges, attorneys, litigants, uh, jurors, we have to adjust to the new legal environment. Uh, even in a climate uh, that uh, it's despite uh, insufficient personnel, physical space lacking the latest technology and limited funding. And maybe funding is probably the most important aspect of, of what uh, the change is uh, bringing about. Um, obviously today, uh, the, particularly for small practitioners, uh, clients expect work done yesterday, not today, yesterday. And of course, uh, uh, particularly if you have larger clients and you're a small office, uh, there are also benchmarks that you have to meet, uh, whether they are for discovery, uh, service, even service of process, discovery and, and timeline for trial. People want things yesterday. So in point of fact, having to get your office up to snuff to deal with new technology, as well as dealing with uh, internal pressures of production, as well as external pressures from clients, you have to be able to meet pressure. It's a pressure society that we're in. COVID-19 and curing the pandemic, of course, the assessment of the legal system. One of the most uh, often things that I've been hearing is that attorneys say they want the system, the unified court system, to take into consideration that um, the fact that uh, there is the broad practice of law. Uh, law offices have different capabilities. And what do I mean by that? Yes, and as I think Hank mentioned, there are parts of the state that, that broadband internet is not, they're not capable yet. And that makes it difficult. There are also other reasons such as, you know, not just geographic, but also you have uh, some attorneys have aged equipment and they don't have the latest in software. Uh, also, small offices usually don't have an IT department or an IT consultant uh, that can uh, assist them with uh, training the attorneys as well as staff. Because of course, today's law office, for the most part, staff does an awful lot of work and the attorney does the actual trial. Um, also, with respect to uh, uh, you, you know, learning software today and, and getting your computer up to snuff, uh, that the attorney, a small office, the attorney has to get uh, become uh, versed 
in the uh, uh, ability to do the latest of, of research or the latest of utilizing these uh, uh, software and different items as they come along in technology. And of course, that's downtime for an attorney, uh, especially when you have to be able to not only be able to load the software, learn it, and be able to use it effectively. And that's without considering the expense of uh, software. Uh, so there's, in short, there's a difference between uh, the imposition of rules and, and laws and, and technology uh, and to achieve a desired result. But uh, reasonable and practical expectation has, you know, you have to uh, uh, have a reasonable and practical expectation in order to gain the successful compliance of the persons that you hope to be able to implement what is necessary to get the job done. And what am I talking about? The disparity in the ability to practice law, of course, using new technology, uh, it could drive some practitioners out of, of business. I think of the younger small uh, attorney wanting to open an office today. Today's young attorney, a lot of times has high college debt, high law school debt. And because of both of those uh, things, uh, with the investment that it takes to open a practice now, that can be uh, inhibiting. You also have the senior practitioner who is just getting used to using a computer, software, Zoom, Skype for business, Microsoft Teams and other emerging technology, and they may be forced into retirement. So those considerations have to be uh, uh, taken uh, by uh, uh, the uh, commission when it's looking at this. Every lawyer is not tech savvy and it will take time. And I know because when I started practicing law in the late seventies, I can tell you that, and I know Judge Marks probably knows this in Hank as well. You, you, when you did legal research, you went to the law library and you came out of the law library with some case law and some, the, maybe the statutes and you shepherdized and you wrote a brief and you wrote it on a legal pad. There was no computer to put it in at the time. Today, you can be sitting in the courthouse and on your cell phone, call up on Westlaw or LexisNexis what is necessary to be able to go to the judge and say, judge, a case just came out an hour ago uh, that, that uh, can be used in a case. So that all of that I'm saying is shifting gears is not as easily and readily uh, available to everyone. And that should be taken into consideration. Um, but despite the limitations that we have, uh, varying abilities, capabilities, judges and attorneys must strive to uh, come into the era of emerging new technologies. Uh, the practical considerations for the courts, of course, and as has been said already, uh, Judge Mark said it, every litigant, no matter the addendum in a civil case or whether they, they have a criminal case, they expect that their case is the most important. So there's no question with respect to that we have to do those things that make sure that their first experience with justice is a, is a good one. Uh, and that means that uh, judges and law clerks with respect to implementing the new uh, technology have to think outside the box and Hank said that. Um, I, I look at the most important thing as being that we comply with as is said in the report, first and uh, sixth amendments of the United States Constitution have to be complied with. And it seems as though the commission is looking at that very closely and that's a good thing. Um, of course, I don't wanna see New York make the mistake uh, that uh, uh, California made in making mandatory uh, 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 virtual trials, uh, especially jury trials. And obviously if you make it mandatory, possibly you're gonna have more appeals, but the focus as a small practitioner who spends time, a lot of time in district court, um, landlord and tenant and family of court are probably the two most backlogged courts. And those are the courts that uh, litigants are most likely to see during their lifetime. And uh, because of that, focus on technology and bringing those courts up to speed would be very good. And as I said, uh, Texas and and Florida that are recited in the report, I'm not so sure that the heart was really in it, and, but I see the integrity and, and the push by this commission and they appear to be doing a good job. Pre-trial conferences and video um, uh, conferencing are gonna be the wave of the future. Anybody that doesn't think so uh, is making a mistake. Um, and the most important thing in virtual conferencing I've found 
because I do it as a special referee for the appellate division, as well as, as being a practicing attorney. I think the most important thing is the judge has to be in control. The judge has to control the environment and, uh, and all of the small uh, items, all the simpler items, benchmark hearings, uh, uh, discovery, oral argument, motions, pretrial considerations, all of those should be done virtually as best that we can. That will help to eliminate a lot of nonsense a lot of people in the courthouse. Uh, the participants, of course, I think for the most part will appreciate that they get to stay where they're at. The benefits, reduce traffic in the courthouse, reduce stress for the court staff, judicial control of conference uh, scheduling, uh, reduced probability of adjournments, reduced wear and tear on court facilities, save traffic, travel time for attorneys and litigants, increased attorney office productivity, due to reduced travel time, reduced attorney billing due to reduced travel time, reduced stress on parking facilities proximate to the courthouse. I don't, can't imagine how many times I've ridden around Queens County Court trying to, to find a parking space with, if I couldn't get in a lot. And as my boss used to say when I worked for a major litigation firm uh, many, many years ago, he used to say, going to court was hurry up and wait. Well, I think we're gonna make a dent in that and I think that most practitioners appreciate the ability to remain in their office and get a judge on the phone or, or be on video conference. Infrastructure considerations, and I know we're running short on time. Um, in my uh, outline, I have a picture of Nassau County Courthouse. That courthouse is vintage 1938. Trying to retrofit that courthouse would be a nightmare. Uh, construction costs will be ridiculous. And I think that the most important thing that uh, it is a nice recommendation by the commission about public private partnerships to get the uh, sponsors that would possibly support the courts. But that may be a problem for the bidding and competitive bidding process, because a lot of times vendors will also be on the state bid or they will be bidding on state or or local projects. And obviously, they wouldn't want to run into that problem with respect to a possible conflict of interest. But looking forward, alternative court facilities, rental space. The courthouse that I just mentioned built in vintage 1938 would be fantastic to, to retrofit it, but the cost will be astronomical. There may be cam, uh, uh, high tech or high speed broadband internet ready buildings. You could take a floor and put a virtual courtroom on that floor and be able to save a lot of money and the legislature very well may uh, go along with it in terms of financing that type of temporary space or even permanent space. And I think of right off the top of my head in Hopog, where the grievance committee is uh, for the uh, second department, that uh, Citibank just moved out. Now you can't tell me that a bank doesn't have internet ready space and it wasn't made ready for that. That might be an alternative for uh, the future of a virtual court setting, uh, possibly getting that type of space. Also alternative funding. Nassau County Supreme Court is actually the location for coastal evacuation for the, um, I guess it, it would be Southeast Long Island. If you're in Long Beach and you have to get out because of flood like Hurricane Sandy, you the, the coastal evacuation location is the parking lot for the Supreme Court, which is now between the Supreme Court and the new family court that is being erected now. There may be infrastructure bill money as well as FEMA money because if you heard yesterday, the president just raised the amount of money from $500 million to a billion dollars available for disaster funding. And that may, there may be part of a bill. So our legislative uh, person should be you know, solicited for the purpose of trying to get some dollars and cents. It very well may be, be the think outside the box type of things. Where's the money and, and get it. I'll try to summarize fairly quickly. The personnel considerations, um, I, I remember when I started practicing, JHOs were very popular. They, they brought back to Queens County where we were trial counsel uh, for Liberty Mutual, and they brought back JHOs to handle calendars. Uh, they did a good job. They did, uh, we had 325D knockdowns that were uh, transferred from Supreme down to Civil, and the judges handled those, and JHOs had some of those assignments. That might be something, because bringing back those who were furloughed just last year or those that retired 
may not be enough. If there may be others that might be willing to serve, it'd be a win-win for the court system. Obviously handling litigation uh, would reduce the backlog. And at the same time, the judges would have an opportunity to uh, promote uh, justice from the bench once again. I mentioned another judge that uh, I have, Gerald Carter, who was a county court judge, uh, 20 years on the bench in county court in major felonies, as well as a major felony trial judge. Excellent person to bring back to do some JHO work, even if it's mediation and settlements, they can handle those type of calendars. For landlord and tenant, uh, this uh, just retired from district court, Scott Fairgrave, what is now the village justice of uh, Mineola. Handle landlord and tenant was a superior judge in that part. Could possibly, if, if something could be worked out with the village and town justices or the village administrations, where possibly those judges could serve part time it is uh, uh, handling a district court calendar. They already handle the traffic and parking court calendars for Nassau County. So that might be an option for, for the system. And then the last two things I have is uh, guidance for judges, of course, uh, as technology emerges with virtual reality, different types of evidence that are coming in, some of the things we're seeing. Um, it would make sense, of course, CLE, focus and maybe there should be some mandatory CLE on technology so that our attorneys are constantly coming up to speed and find out what's available to them, maybe not at a ridiculous price. Also judges, we have the Judicial Institute. I uh, attended that when I was a village justice. And of course the training is, is superior, but judges are gonna have to constantly be given uh, updates because evidence is changing. The way it's coming in is different. Taking a Zoom set of evidence is different than taking it in person. Matter of fact, I had a case where I just realized that I was looking for where's the yellow markings that, that the court reporter used. Well, they weren't yellow because we marked pre-marked evidence um, with a virtual conference. And so therefore the reporter had a set and they were all mailed by counsel. Uh, I want to give kudos to Norman St. George. He's done a fantastic job. The bench trial uh, uh, bench trial, uh, virtual bench trial protocols and procedures uh, manual is excellent, and hopefully there will be a uh, companion uh, a jury trial. It'll be a lot more uh, difficult to put together and a little bit more technical, but uh, he and his colleagues did a fantastic job in putting that together. I use it. Uh, I found it to be uh, quite helpful, particularly the nitty gritty things about what do you do with a difficult witness or make sure that the protocols, the tire is proper, make sure that things are pre-marked and what conferences council should have in advance. Those are great suggestions that cuts down on trial time. Um, also summary jury trials, maybe it should be promoted a little bit more uh, uh, through the bar associations. I'm sure they would be willing to put it out and if an evaluation team could be put together that would screen cases, take a look at the cases as they uh, come down at before compliance conference and maybe suggest the council, get the council together and have an evaluation uh, uh, situation with the uh, future trial judge and possibly could get a stipulation that the summary jury trial would be the way to go. Cuts down in the amount of time once more. And there, a lot of times attorneys hope that, uh, you know, there is a settlement tactic to hold it up as much as you can. If you get down to a summary jury trial, very well may eliminate much of the backlog uh, for, for getting those cases that are not as complex out of the way. And uh, last but not least, I, I just said in my conclusion that, uh, and I, I, I wanna read it because I feel it's important. And it's once emerging new technologies are regularly offered in evidence in New York courts, such technologies are destined to become an integral part of future court litigation. Law firms of all sizes will have to prepare for this reality. Legal profession, the legal profession must prepare to move forward wisely in a diligent and cautious manner, always mindful of the impact of emerging new technologies on equal access to justice. We must also acknowledge that emerging new technologies will require the implementation of new laws and court rules to regulate their intervention in litigation. Issues that will need to be addressed on an ongoing basis include economic inequities of litigants and practitioners, disparities caused by differences in attorney and judge familiarity and comfortability with new technology, as well as the financial limitations of both the practitioner and the unified court system. Consideration and continued evaluation of these issues 
will be required to ensure equal access to justice in the state of New York. And I hope that I've been able to assist you in uh, discussing this topic today. I wanna to thank everyone uh, for the opportunity. I would like to thank the three speakers for just wonderful presentations, all of which were, I think, exceedingly informative. Um, we've seemed to have run out of time and actually run beyond our time. Yeah. Um, I suspect that we're gonna have to pass on questions and answers. But uh, again, a very, very large thank you to our three speakers. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.